A very good morning to every one of you friends, those who are pursuing this course on marketing management, principles of marketing. Hope you are enjoying your journey in the course. As you know, I am Dr. Rajendra Prasad Sharma, Professor of Marketing at Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. Today, I am going to engage you in this session on two very important pricing approaches. The first approach that I am going to discuss with you is demand-based pricing, demand-oriented pricing. And the second is competition-based, competition-oriented pricing. Demand and competition-oriented pricing. So welcome aboard. Let me introduce the topic to you first. You know that price is the most flexible element in the marketing mix of any company. And this price has the power, the you know, force to change the demand patterns. When a product is launched at high prices, it is not able to create enough demand because not every consumer in the society can adopt it. So in the earlier sessions, we have discussed that in the consumer adoption process, there are innovators who make things happen, who are high on resources. They buy the products even if the prices are high. But if mass demand needs to be generated, the prices need to go lower. So prices are so powerful in influencing the demand patterns. And through pricing, pricing tactics, strategies, methods, approaches, practices, firms, brands, companies can influence demand. But demand also influences prices. So when demand is very high and supply is short, companies try to extract a higher price. Though it may not be fair because you are taking advantage and you are exploiting the uh, vulnerability of the customers. But it happens as a practice. So one method is demand-based pricing and this draws heavily from the domain of economics. Microeconomics particularly, the theory of demand and the other approach, which is competition-based, draws from the domain of strategy, the battlefield, the war. In marketing, all of us know that marketing is a warfare. Companies fight with each other for that peace of the customer. And to acquire a customer sometimes, they resort to pricing mechanism in such a way that you can snatch a customer away from your competitor. Or you would like at least to benchmark your competitors or follow the competitors, imitate the competitors in terms of your pricing strategies. Telecom companies, many service operations companies, airlines, they are found to follow this kind of competition-based pricing. You need to be offering your value proposition at competing prices. So with this in mind, I would like to take you ahead in our this session of the day. And we should first discuss the demand-based pricing. Yeah, 
you know, in economics, you must have studied that the price and demand, the quantity demanded at that price, they are inversely proportionate. The relationship is inverse. So the typical demand curve falls from the left to right. If you see on a paper opposite you. So basically what happens is it shows that at lower prices, the quantity demanded is high and at higher prices, the quantity demanded is low. This is the law of demand. Let me restate, let me state what is the law of demand. Ceteris paribus means other things remaining the same. Which other things? If the income of the customer does not change, if the customer tastes and preferences do not change, if the good in demand, the product service in demand is not an inferior product, inferior good, like salt, because this principle may not apply to salt. Salt may not be demanded in high quantity if prices are low, because you know, in consumer products markets, one way may not consume high amounts of salt simply because it is low priced. Or even if it gets high price, highly priced, you know that you will not consume lesser quantity of salt because in that case, your food will taste insipid. Therefore, other things remaining the same condition is applied. Ceteris paribus, the quantity demanded of something will rise if the prices go down. This is the law of demand. And this law of demand is beautifully captured by the economists in forms of demand curves. On y-axis you have the price and on x-axis you have the quantity, yeah? So the prices are, you know, indicating the elasticity. It's price elasticity of demand. The demand is elastic. So the demand changes because of the price changing and that's called the price elasticity of demand. So what is price elasticity? It is defined as the percentage change in quantity demanded due to the percentage change in price. So let's say there is 10% change in quantity demanded. 10% change in the quantity demanded if there is a 5% change in the price. So if the price increased 5%, the quantity demanded decreased 10%. So this beautifully captures the, the, the gradient or the elasticity of demand. And this is commonly, as I said, known as price elasticity of demand. So demand is elastic or demand can be inelastic. So in certain markets like B2B markets, demands are usually inelastic. And there's a reason why the demand is inelastic in those situations. So if Arrow Shirt has to buy fabric because the shirt demand has gone up in that case, if the fabric prices go up, there is no reason that the manufacturer of arrow shirts will demand lesser quantity of the fabric. Why? Because it is an intermediate product which goes into the manufacturing of arrow shirts. Britannia cheese, if the cheese is in demand, Britannia's demand for milk 
will not go down. It has to keep pace with the demand in cheese. And therefore, B2B demand is supposed to be likely to be inelastic. That means it does not respond to the changes in the prices. However, the B2B buyers might look for alternative suppliers in some cases. So the demand can be friends, elastic. Demand can be inelastic as in the case of B2B. And the demand can also be having, you know, substitution effect and that is called cross elasticity of demand. So let me give you an example. If the demand for coffee goes up, if the demand for coffee goes up, yeah, due to some reason, or if the price of tea goes up, the demand for coffee will have to go up because tea then can be substituted by coffee. If the coffee prices go up, the demand for tea can actually go up. The same you can see in case of diesel, petrol and CNG. So if my car has all three, no, you know, my car doesn't have three options. I have to buy petrol only. But if petrol prices only keep on going up, up and up, in that case, the demand for diesel based vehicles might go up. And this is actually substitution effect and you can term it as cross elasticity. So elasticity is something which we have understood and it influences the demand and the relationship between price and demand is very, very important. As firms looking to maximize or optimize their profits, the profit will increase when prices increase. So you are interested in increasing the prices because that is a way to increase your profits. Yeah. However, when you increase the price to increase your profit, the demand will also tend to decrease because the price has increased. Therefore, the firms need to find a you know, happy mid path, an equilibrium. So equilibrium is where that price where demand equals a supply. You know, what happens is that at high prices, firms are willing to supply more. At lower prices, firms are not willing to supply that much, but demand is high. So the consumers are in that case willing to pay more. So this brings the demand and supply market forces, the invisible hands to come together and determine the prices in the market as per the forces of the market. Okay, so demand and prices are that intricate. Elasticity is a wonderful concept from the domain of economics. So how much does the demand, the units sold increase with an increase in the price? If you're now the major is that if your elasticity is more than one, E is more than one, which means demand is elastic. If E is equivalent to one, that means it is unitary. And if it is less than one, that means demand is inelastic. Demand does not change. So demand curves can take different kind of a shape. If there is a horizontal demand curve, demand line, that shows that whatever may be, you know, the, the quantity demanded can be any, the price remains static. Okay, so the demand does not much change. The demand may change, but price remains static.
Yeah. And on the other hand, what happens is the demand remains static, the prices might change. And that is an inelastic demand. Okay. And a completely elastic demand is that, you know, same price, it may be demanded at different levels, whatever can be the demand. But usually, in principle, demand follows price. Demand is dependent on price. Yeah, that's the concept of the elasticity of demand. So uh, let me cite an example that suppose you charge $7 and you sell 10 units. So your total revenue is $70. Now, if you reduce the price, the demand will change, demand increases. So if your firm decides to charge $4, not $7, and in that case, not 10 units, but now you sell 40 units, your total revenue has become now 100, 160, $4 multiplied by 40, 160. And earlier it was $7 price with 10 uh, units, so $70. So you have an additional increase in the income of, to the tune of $90. And this, but decreases your margin contribution margin per unit because your cost of manufacturing that product or cost of goods sold is high. And, you know, if your margin is decreased by $3 per unit, then that has to be made up by increased volume of the sales. So you need to balance the two. And this is what the essence of understanding the demand-based pricing is. Yeah, in case of elastic demand, this is how it operates. But in case of inelastic demand, what happens is that $7, you sell 35 units. And if you charge $4, you sell 40 units. So, because it is inelastic, so it does not go on much, you know, it doesn't change drastically like, like from, you know, 10 units to 40 units. It has only gone up from 35 units to 40 units with a decrease of $3 price per unit. So therefore, you know, what happened is that your decreased margin by $3 is actually not made up with adequate increased unit sales. So in case of inelastic demand, maybe you would not like to introduce price changes or price cuts like this. But the practicality, you have to do it if your competitors start cutting you there. So therefore demand and competition based prices are linked. In certain segments, the competition is higher. In certain others, the competition is not that intense. And friends, this phenomenon of demand based pricing is also dependent upon the segment. Elasticity varies by segment. Do you think luxury products, the demand is as elastic as in case of necessities like milk and fruit and cereals and apparel? Not really. So certain segments are not that elastic. Yeah, it varies segment to segment. Yeah, and there are so many segments of the market that we have as you have studied and gone through a module on STP segmenting, targeting and petitioning. So let me give you some, you know, rationale behind this. 
demand increases with increased customers or desires. So if a customer is desperate to acquire a particular brand or product, that demand is likely to increase. So if it is an aspirational product, if you think that it has to be Sony TV only, if you think that it has to be Walt Disney only, if it, you think that I must be entertained by a Netflix uh, OTT platform, if demand increases, it increases because customers' desires are, you know, inflated for that product. With favorable perception of the product's benefits or brand image. So if I consider some brands to be more, uh, you know, like closer to me, closer to my heart, and if competitor brands are not available or are not favorable to me, or I don't consider them good for me. And if there are few good substitutes, if no substitutes are there or some few substi good substitutes are not there. And if substitutes are there and if they're priced too very high, uh, in such cases, demand is likely to increase. But this demand is more elastic. When, when the demand is more elastic, well, it's elastic when the customers don't care, don't care about the purchase. When the customers don't have strong preferences, when the item is a luxury rather than a necessity, when many substitutes are available, when purchase is large compared to income. Now, when such things happen, then demand is considered to be more elastic. Yep. So if I consider a particular item that, okay, for me, this is luxury. I, this is, I, uh, I was never able to afford uh, Himalaya water, but I now consider it uh, within my reach and it's a luxurious water. So I can pay actually a little more 20 rupees, 15 rupees. So demand is basically more elastic in such cases when I consider the product to be aspirational or some kind of a luxury, which I could never afford. For example, flying was a luxury for certain people who only traveled by train earlier. And in that case, you know, there was a high elastic demand for the airlines. So friends, with this, we need to understand that what do you think has higher elasticity? Is it the necessity like petrol? or is it something like fast food? Petrol or fast food? Fast food and carbonated drinks. So the product categories also play a very important role. If I have to commute, I have a car, and therefore it does not matter whether petrol, petrol prices, you know, these days are rising and declining. I mean, they are fluctuating. And we see a lot of media reports that the prices have been consistently rising. But even with that, my demand for petrol has not gone down. Now that shows that the price elasticity is high here. Sorry, price elasticity is not there. In case of petrol, price elasticity is not there, is low. But in case of fast food, etc., if subway sandwich prices reduce or go up, and in that case, I may buy, consume more of it. I think this denotes that price elasticity is higher in case of fast foods but is not that high in case of petrol. Because in case of fast foods, the substitutes are also there. But in case of petrol, the substitutes are not there. In case of fast foods, maybe my income plays a role, but in case of petrol, maybe my income also does not play much role because according to my base income, I already acquired a vehicle. 
So prices follow the demand patterns and dynamic pricing as a principle, the buyer and seller, they basically sell at a price at which it takes care of the fluctuating demand. So for example, you must have seen at a restaurant that they have happy hours. The simple reason is that happy hours, those hours, happy hours are those hours where demand of restaurant services are low. So the customers actually are attracted through lower prices. And on peak hours, peak days, they do not offer any kind of discounts. Earlier, even telecom companies used to offer such kind of demand-based pricing. Peak time pricing and off-peak pricing. Yeah, so this is demand-based pricing. But competition-based pricing is equally important. So going by the competition-based pricing, you know, price competition is something which is not to be ignored, but if you pay too much attention to it, a firm may get ruined because it does not make sense to get into a pricing war, a price war. But yes, when you set your prices, you can always benchmark some of your competitors, whom you consider as your competitors. So as competitor-based pricing, companies use going rate pricing, which means that let's sell at the price at which everybody else in the market is selling. So this is reminding you about the perfect competition model. Going rate price. Telecom companies, as I said, they usually follow this kind of going rate price because everybody is char charging per second X price. So let me also sell it at that price. If Airtel broadband is available at price X per month, then Geo broadband can follow suit and can offer at the same going rate. But in case of large projects, companies require the buyers, tenders, require sealed bids so in which the competitors cannot get to see till the tender is opened it's confidential so sealed bid pricing is also used and this sealed bid is basically to compare your price quote with your competitors so that you can win that contract yeah, so if I cite an example about a company, I teach a case on consumer products in my marketing management case in which there are so many washing powders companies. So one company which was a market leader, like let's say Hindustan Unilever itself, because of the entry of inferior quality, lower grade variants in certain regions. It could be Gadi detergent, it could be Nirma, it could be some other brand. And with inferior formulations, those companies offer their products at lower prices. Now a brand which is an established one, which is a premium one and the customers respect and love that brand they may not be in a position to reduce the price, but in a price sensitive Indian market due to competition, that demand goes down. So it has an implication. So therefore friends, we need to look at the fact that how is it that you can initiate price changes to the price cuts by your competitors? Should you respond desperately to every price cut or every price increase? Yeah, should you increase prices because your competitors are increasing? And if yes, why? Is it because of the cost going up, inflation rising? Is it because of the over demand of the category or the products that you're selling? 
And why should you price cut? Offer a price cut? Is it because you have excess capacity? Is it because uh, your market share is falling? Is it because you can dominate your market through lower costs? As you know, Nirma did dominate the market through lower costs. Cost reduction is what they practiced. And therefore, even a company like Hindustan Unilever was forced to come out with a variant like wheel. Wheel they did not have right from beginning, but it was um, a market need. So friends, I would like to leave you with a discussion question that do you think it is advisable for a company to compete on price? Why or why not? You think about it. I have given you enough of regions, but I've told you that if you compete on prices, it can be ruinous. It can ruin you on the competitors. The customers only can win. Okay, even your competitors can get ruined. Nobody may earn, but this is something that happens in a market where competition is cutthroat and very intense. Okay, so with that, I am closing this session down. In this session, we discussed how the prices can be demand-based, how prices can increase or decrease customer demand because demand is elastic and how competition can influence prices and how a firm must initiate and respond to the changes to the competitive pricing. Thank you.